this is not a trick question. What happens in 19 days? New Year's? <laughs> yeah, 19 days to Christmas, I mean, it's weird, huh? This is probably one of the earliest Christmas sermons that you've ever heard. We're barely into the month of December and the preacher's going to go on about Christmas. The reason for this is that I want to help us, really seriously now, I want to help us prepare for this holiday, whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not. You see, in the church, there are people who absolutely love this time of year. They just love this time of year. They go all out in decorating, celebrating, the, the happiness that they feel. It's a joyous time for them. And then others, on the other hand, think that, well, for some, I've you know, discussed this with some people, they think, well, it's unchristian to even acknowledge this feast, won't even have a Christmas tree in their homes, they don't send Christmas cards, you know, they just don't want any part of this, this holiday, if you, if you wish. So I'd like to address some of these issues and help all of us have a, at least a Christian, not Christmas, but a Christian spirit about, about Christmas. So let's talk about what you already know, okay? We know, for example, that it is not a celebration, Christmas, for example, is not a celebration spoken of or even required in the Bible. Although the Bible describes the human birth of Jesus, it doesn't give us any instructions for us to remember or to celebrate His birth with some kind of ceremony, some kind of feast, or celebration, absolutely no instructions, no inference, nothing that tells us we ought to do something special to remember the birth of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the only ceremony that underscores birth is baptism. And it is our own birth as Christians that we live out, if you wish, through the ceremony of baptism. You know, Paul talks about that, Romans chapter six, verses three, four, five, and six. You know, we're buried with Christ, we resurrect with Christ. You know, that's the birth that the Bible talks about, our birth in baptism. The only other ceremony that the Bible actually, New Testament, gives us is the Lord's Supper, the communion, which is a remembrance, not of the birth of Jesus, but of the death of Jesus on our behalf. The death of Jesus which makes our own birth and rebirth in the waters of baptism actually possible. So Christmas is a, a religious holiday. It's based on a biblical truth, but it is not a necessary thing. It is not a command uh, or even a suggestion uh, in, in the Bible. So we know that, we, we understand that. Another thing that we know is that many of the things associated with Christmas have pagan roots or worldly purposes. We know that. We know that Christmas began to be observed somewhere in the third or fourth century uh, AD as an initial effort to Christianize the usual pagan winter festivals of the time. Uh, the Roman Solus Invicti, that holiday, along with the Druid winter ritual, was a time of pagan revelry, and uh, at that time the church wanted to give people a chance to keep their festivals, but remove the pagan ideas, and so they introduced Christian ideas in their place. They, they kind of kept the, the time and the the festiveness of the, of the holidays, these pagan things, but they infused them with Christian meaning. So the holiday was turned into a Christ celebration, Christmas, the mass, the M-A-S-S, the mass part, that's the Latin word for celebrate. So it was a Christ celebration, Christ mass, Christmas. The, uh, the Druids, the Yule log used by the Druids and other trees uh, that were used in pagan ceremonies, uh, these were replaced by the evergreen tree, 
which actually symbolize the changelessness of Christ. The evergreen's the same all year round, right? Well, it represented the changelessness of Christ, always the same, yesterday, today, tomorrow. What better tree, if you wish, to represent Him than a tree that just doesn't change from season to season? Um, the practice of offering gifts to the gods in order to hurry the gods into sending the spring weather um, to uh, send the spring weather sooner. Uh, this practice was changed where people then began to give money or food or fuel actually to the poor because this honored Christ, helping the poor, giving gifts to the poor, this was a way of honoring uh, Jesus Christ. So there are other vestiges of pagan rites like you know, wreaths or candles whose pagan roots are long forgotten having been replaced with Christian symbolism for so many, so many centuries until uh, this day. So we recognize that even though the celebration of Christmas uh, originally um, used a pagan date and some of the elements, these things were converted to Christian usage and with time Christmas has come to be a completely Christian idea with absolutely no reference whatsoever to, to paganism. So that's some of the things that we know about Christmas, the history of the feast and how it evolved into what we have today. I also want to talk about what we feel about Christmas. You know, one of the things that Christmas does, it, it brings out emotion in people. For some, the emotion is sadness. Uh, sadness of being alone or sick or in turmoil, uh, that feeling tends to increase at Christmas time. It, it's a dangerous period for suicides because people have very strong feelings aroused at this time of year. So if you're a happy person, you know, perhaps the happiness is increased, but if you're sad and you're depressed, uh, the Christmas season tends to aggravate that sadness and that depression. You know, uh, people who work in public safety and hospitals and so on and so forth will tell you that uh, Christmas time there's a heightened level of attempted suicides and drug abuse and that, that, type, of, that type of things. Um, other people you know, don't recognize Christmas and they reject the holiday altogether because they can't get over the commercialization of this holiday and the, the pagan roots of it. The idea that a Christian would be involved in something religious that the Bible does not specifically command, this is how they feel about it. And they feel very strongly about the idea. You know, no, no references to Christmas, they tolerate it at best, you know, but that's, that's what they feel about it. For most, however, it is a time of gladness and family and peace. It's a special time with special feelings that are not experienced at other times of the year. Let's face it, you know, why, why is it that we want snow to fall? You know, we hate snow, I moved away from snow. You know, they tell me, you must miss Canada. Really? <laughs> no, not in February, that's for sure. But there's something about snow at Christmas time, right? Wake up uh, Christmas morning, snow on the ground, there's just something special about that. So regardless of what group that you fit in, you know, the happy, happy ones, the sad, sad, sad ones, or the ones that reject it all, regardless of what group that you're in, one thing is for sure, Christmas affects us somehow, one way uh, or another. And so there's a little bit of history and a little bit about how we feel about Christmas. So my next you know, topic is, so what are we going to do with this Christmas thing that we all experience? You can't avoid it if you live in the United States. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I've reminded you, if you wish, about some of the things we know and some of the ways we feel about Christmas. Now I want to share with you some of the things that we ought to do with Christmas. I believe that what you do at Christmas will affect how you feel at this time of year. So I have some recommendations. They're not commands of any kind. Like I said, there's nothing in the Bible that commands anything about Christmas, but they're suggestions. So suggestion number one is this. At Christmas time, honor Christ. 
honor Christ at Christmas time. I mean, there is still a Lord's Day during the Christmas holidays. So make sure that all of us, we honor Christ. How, how ironic it is that a man-made celebration honoring Jesus would sometimes interfere with the divinely appointed day of, of honoring Jesus. You get my point here? How disappointing it must be to God that the disciples of Jesus would not come to church to honor Jesus according to the Bible because they find it too inconvenient to break away from their man-made celebration of Jesus at Christmas time. That's a, you know, that's a weird thing that happens. Oh, no time for church, well, we got Christmas. We got stuff happening at Christmas. I don't have time to go up to church. You know, the Bible says to us, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So put it into your minds. Right now, early on in the month, before it really gets crazy, that you will not insult the Lord by refusing to gather with Him around the communion table in order to celebrate Him around the dinner table. More important that we celebrate with Him around the communion table than we celebrate Him around the dinner table. The first order of business for the Christ celebration or the Christ mass or Christmas is to honor Christ during this time. And certainly a primary way of doing this is to make sure that we make time for worship. Let's keep our priorities straight no matter what time of year it is. Not tell you, you know, in the world there's, all, there's always a reason not to attend worship service. There's always a reason, too cold, too hot, too rainy, too slick, too rushed, got stuff to do, shopping, I'm late. You know, there's a million reasons to avoid attending worship. At Christmas time, let's not allow the human celebration of Jesus to interfere with the spiritual celebration of Jesus. Another thing I recommend let us keep Christmas Christian. Let's make sure that the spirit of Christmas, uh, of Christmas uh, is equal to the spirit of Christ. A lot of people don't celebrate Christmas because it has pagan roots. And you know what? I respect their decision and I understand their feelings. I, I celebrate it because I believe the essence of Christianity is the power of conversion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says the following, and I'll make my point. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, or thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The wonder of Christ is that He takes someone who is unholy, and He makes that person holy by the virtue of His power and His purity and His love and His sacrifice. Christianity has done this with the Christmas feast. You see my parallel here? It has taken something that was worldly, pagan, and unwholesome, and through the power of truth, and love and Christ has transformed it into a universal thing of beauty and delight representing the very best ideals of the Christian spirit, which are peace and love. So let's not allow the world to convert Christmas and us back to paganism. You know, Christmas becomes a pagan feast when we participate along with the pagans in revelry and drunkenness, 
You know, I can tell you, I had my first alcoholic drink as a, as a young boy at Christmas time. Why? Because it was, come on, it's Christmas! <laughs> it's great, yeah, a beer, you're 14, you, you want a beer? Sure, come on, you know, Tony, let him have a beer. It's Christmas! I got permission to smoke when I was 15. I was smoking long before I was 15. I think I was 11 or 12. But I got permission to smoke at 14 or 15. When do you think? At Christmas, the party is going on, everybody's smoking. Dad, Dad, can I have one? It's Christmas, come on. <laughs> and therein began a 20 year habit that was harder to break than taking illegal drugs. The day I said, I'm not smoking pot, I'm not taking you know, hash, I'm not taking drugs anymore. On the day that I decided to do that, I never did it again after that. And that's after having done it for years. But smoking cigarettes, man, that took a lot. <laughs> a lot of trial and error before I got rid of that nasty habit. Unwholesome, unchristian habit. But where did it start? Christmas time. Because for some crazy reason, people think, hey, it's Christmas. God is relaxing the standards because it's Christmas. Let's not participate along with the pagans in unbridled worldliness. Let's not participate with the pagans in gluttony, in fornication. Let's not do that. You see, the trouble with feasts has always been their danger of turning into excuses for sin. You go to a wedding, a wedding is supposed to be something very beautiful, a man and a woman are pledging you know, uh, their lives to one another in marriage, and then the feast begins, and the bar opens. And what was beautiful and noble two hours after the bar has been opened, man A is eyeing woman B that is not his wife. Why? Because the bar has been opened for two hours. And so something beautiful turns into an occasion for sinfulness. So let's be careful that we don't use Christmas as an occasion or as an excuse to act in an unchristian un -Christian way. To me, that would be the height of insult to God. To use something that's supposed to celebrate His Son as a cover for iniquity. Another suggestion, my last one. Let's make sure that we, as Christians, make an honest effort to restore the true spirit of Christ at Christmas. You know, when Christmas was begun, it was done with the purpose of Christianizing a pagan society. All of the symbols and all of the practices were changed and they were recast in order to teach and to glorify Christ. A pagan practice that I mentioned before was the giving of the gifts to the gods in order to win their favor. This was changed by the Christians of the era to the giving of gifts to the poor. It didn't start off with you know, husband and wife and parents to children. The giving of gifts began as Christians gave gifts to the poor in order to reflect the spirit of Christ who gave his life for many, who came to serve and not to be served, who said it was more blessed to give than to receive. And so this tradition has been commercialized to the point where we almost exclusively use Christmas to give and receive presents between ourselves and our friends and occasionally those who serve us in some way. As Christians, 
we should restore and return to the original purpose for Christmas, and that is to honor Christ and bless others in His name. In this way, we as Christians demonstrate that as, as, as far as we're concerned, we understand the true meaning of Christmas. You know, I said before that there's a relationship between how you feel and what you do at Christmas. For example, if you honor Christ with obedience, you will feel at peace with God and yourself, not only at Christmas, but every day of the year. Sin you know, is always a burden, all the time is a burden. Disobedience towards God, whether it is missing church or refusing to be baptized or cheating on an exam or lying to your spouse, whatever, whatever it is. Sin always causes anxiety and guilt and shame and, and discouragement. If you've dishonored Christ by disobeying and wish to be right with God, well then do that so that you can honestly feel the peace and the joy today, tomorrow, this Christmas, every Christmas until Jesus comes. You know, the sad thing is the world exhausts itself at Christmas time to get just a little, just a little aroma of Christ. It's that aroma of Christ that gives them that, that feeling of happiness at Christmas time because they get just a little aroma of what, you know, what is possible when Christ is, is first and foremost uh, the, the, the focus of attention. They just get a whiff of Christ and look how, whoa, you know, let's, let's be happy and people are feeling good. Just a small aroma of Him. But Christians, we, we can taste Him and feel Him and breathe Him in fully every single day. What, what the world is searching for and gets a little whiff of at Christmas time for a moment, we have access to 365 days of the year. Because we can be in the spirit of, not Christmas, we can be in the spirit of Christ all the time. Morning, noon, and night. We don't need a tree, we don't need colored lights, we don't need presents. And how do we do that? As Christians, we keep our mind and our heart and our conscience right with God. And we do what we have to do to stay right with Him. And the reward, the present for that, peace of mind, joy, true hope, true love for God. The more I obey God, the more I love Him. You understand what I'm saying? Obeying God does not breed fear, brothers and sisters. Obeying God breeds joy. I love Him so much. The only thing that stops me is my own sinfulness, to love Him even more. And then my final encouragement is for those who want to restore the true spirit of Christ to Christmas this year. If you want to make an effort at that. Well, here's my suggestion. Before we purchase all the gifts or stock up on food and goodies for ourselves, nothing wrong with that. I, this is not a diatribe against giving gifts and eating well, no, no, no. But before we do all of this, before we have the first eggnog or taste the great pies, Let's give the first portion of our Christmas celebration to the widows, to the poor of our church and our community. Let's offer to God our Christmas celebration by giving the very first gift to the poor and the needy. Instead of that being like an afterthought when we're in the middle of, you know, giving our credit card a beating there, buying stuff for everybody, let's sit down and say, okay, who am I going to give that really needs something? Just like it was done in the very first place many centuries ago. 
If we do that, several things are going to happen. First, we will truly honor God with this feast. Why? Because the very first portion of our giving will go, not to Him in the collection plate, will go to someone who is needful, and that's pleasing to God. And we will build up the body of Christ in this community. Doing so will bless those who are less fortunate. And we will begin a, a good work that others can build upon and continue even after we're gone. We will recapture the feeling of love and joy and peace that Christmas is all about. And we can do this in a variety of ways. I have to make a parenthetical statement here because sometimes this idea that I'm you know, proposing gets confused. I'm not saying the money that you're going to take on the Sunday of Christmas, you know, Friday, that following Sunday, that offering money that you give in the plate, instead of giving it in the plate, take that money and give it to the Red Cross. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> now what I'm saying is, once you have done that, which is what we're supposed to do, the first portion to the Lord, because it's Christmas, the next portion should be taken to give to someone who needs something. And I'm not talking about your kid who wants a new Nintendo game or your, you know, your husband who'd like a new rifle or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the next portion. How about filling a bag or two of groceries for a needy family through our brown bag Christmas? What is brown bag Christmas? What is it? It's just an opportunity to do something right and good that's pleasing to God and helpful to some. That's all it is. Or you can select a family in this congregation or that you know that can use some help. Or you can give to your favorite charity, homeless mission, cancer research. Doesn't matter. These and other ways will be your personal statement and your personal witness that Christmas, above all else, should honor Jesus Christ. And there is no better way to do this than to be helping and giving to those who are in need and doing it in His name. Try that this year, just try it 